I keep on thinking of Ray Navarro, especially with the pulp in town and all the <laughs> endless, endless um, reverence on television. I keep thinking of Ray Navarro and his Jesus drag, and that to me was a very complex moment. It was not completely irre um, irreverent. Uh, towards the end of Ray's life, he became very religious. And so his dressing up as Jesus at that action was sort of a living bumper sticker as to, you know, what would Jesus do if he was gay and he was in the street at a Stop the Church action. And uh, Ray was acting out his, uh, was performing, I should say, his version of that. And I still think in terms of what ought not to be omitted is what Ray's talking about, um, or what he was talking about in that interview clip, the fact that we still cannot have, in, in many uh, states in this nation, an honest discussion about comprehensive, safer sex ed, or sex, sexuality. I don't want to forget the continuum that I always find myself in whenever I talk about AIDS. Because I, I'm not up here to talk about the good old days. I'm really here right now as someone who's engaged in um, prevention justice and someone who still sees a very um, important struggle um, ahead of us. Omission and erasure are very much a part of what, why ACT UP started. Okay? We, we have a situation, Larry Kramer is in the audience, probably no one can speak more clearly to the kinds of um, complete erasure that was going on around the, um, the, the crisis um, in 1981. I, I don't want people to forget those days. They were horrible. We should never forget what happened. We should never let it happen again. Um, another, on another level, I connect to the theme of erasure and omission as a dyke and as someone who really connects to um, the project of the Lesbian History Archives. You know, that, that all of this history must be preserved. Now, I don't have control over all of these videotapes that are out there right now. Many of them are at the New York Public Library. Some of them are in personal uh, collections. But I feel a responsibility to continuously go back to that material to keep it from becoming just dust which in many cases it, it is becoming dust, or it was on the verge of becoming dust. Um, I don't want an erasure of our history. So um, I guess the long and the short of it is, I, I like to keep that idea of fighting omission, erasure, I like to keep that idea on a continuum with our history and with the present struggle that's still going on. Actually, I think the aesthetics is part of the content. And um, as an activist, I actually, probably the most important lessons I learned were from two things. One was ACT UP. Um, I was 17, 18 years old, going through these demonstrations. And the other was punk rock. Um, and I'll see how this comes around. It's because I think from ACT UP, I learned that um, radical politics can be exuberant and fun, even in the face of tragedy. And from punk rock, I learned that anybody can do it. Um, and I, I think that actually the aesthetic of a lot of this, is, and it's quite explicit in Diva, Diva TV, but it's also there in Paper Tiger, and even the more well-produced items, it's really, you know, the aesthetic is about you can pick up a camcorder and do this too. You can actually record your own history. You don't have to leave it up to the mainstream television and news networks to record your history. You can actually do it yourself. And I think this is an important aesthetic lesson, but I also think it's an important political lesson. Um, is that, it's, that once you start to realize you can represent yourself on the screen, you can also represent yourself on the streets. Um, and I think that those two things are absolutely connected to one another. Is that DIY media making um, is a small step to DIY politics making. That is, do-it-yourself politics, which is the base of democracy and popular democracy. And then that folds right back into DIY media making. Um, it's a, I think that those relationships actually make a lot of sense to go together. The one warning I'd have, though, and, and I think is that, and I think, again, ACT UP navigates this brilliantly, is to understand that that DIY aesthetic, while carries a politics of participation in it, also sometimes cannot be read by a larger audience who is used to 
watching the spectacle, used to having a slick, seamless, you know, a package given to them. But I think one of the things that Act Out did is they actually played both parts, okay? The flashy stickers, the flashy graphics, the well-crafted designs, and so on and so forth, but also be the TV. And so I actually think that there's a real model to be learned about how to speak to different audiences and how sometimes what you have to do is use a different format to get your message out, but also sometimes that you should really think about the medium being part of the message. And so advice to citizen journalists. Um, yeah, it's a pretty obvious one, is that it's not just about who gets to speak, it's how they get to speak. And how they get to speak says a lot about, you know, feeling, communicating, and, um, and how do I want to say this, um, uh, proselytizing about uh, the right of any person, not just the professional, to make news. Thanks a lot. Act Up had a sticker through the late 90s, uh, you know, nice big block letters, the AIDS crisis is not over. The knot was in red. I put it outside, the knot leaves it out, so it ends up reading out. Uh, as a metaphor, uh, I, uh, I think we have lost uh, the war in AIDS collectively. Uh, I don't think anything has changed for our communities, for the communities at large without uh, without radical people coming together, creative radical people, and uh, are you in the room and uh, you know, a few others, uh, there's no synergy that I don't see a community anymore. Um, I see, uh, and certainly we had a few successes in that time, not the big ones. Uh, and Fauci will say over and over again in international aid conferences that it's perfectly clear that one cannot live their entire lives on these uh, AIDS combination therapies. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the, in the height of uh, AIDS in New York City, there were 6,000 people dying. Well, today we still have 3,000 people dying. And just like the very early days, Half of them are always diagnosed in the emergency room as focal needs. You know, there's more of a us and them than there ever was in the 80s, I believe, the early 90s, uh, between positive and negative people. Uh, who hasn't been on the website? You know, <laughs> saying, uh, uh, I want a spanking partner. I'm negative. You be too. <laughs> uh, oh, whatever. It's not a, it's not a pretty picture. We're, uh, uh, well, one one more example. You know, in the newspaper article, there was a uh, a feature on James Kern, the former head of the AIDS division of the CDC, and uh, headline was something like, you know, a career politician spends his life fighting AIDS, and he was in it for a dozen years, fifteen years, maybe twenty. Um, and in the second paragraph, it said, quoting him. And at a certain point, eight activists were sending me uh, postcards in the mail, thousands of postcards with my picture inside of a Target. And that was all the newspaper wrote. They never asked, why would, why would activists send them? And it was part of a three, four year campaign of changing the definition of AIDS. So ultimately, more people were covered in the, uh, the healthcare system and were able to uh, live a little bit longer. Uh, that was one of the successes back then. Uh, but there's still no uh, cure, there's no community, and I fear the worst. Well, while all of my colleagues were expanding and commencing the alternative media channels and coming up with the most wonderful, edgy, elegant, um, manifestos, um, I was proving my masochism by dealing with mainstream media and trying to get the message of ACT UP out there because we realized this was, you know, the days when dinosaurs walked the earth and there were no blogs and no iPods and no websites that could get out the truth. We, I had to go to these mainstream people and granted they weren't as corporate owned as now, but it still was something, you know, they were resistant. 
And but I had on my side a bunch of amazing, creative, sometimes crazy queen people who could create the most wonderful demonstrations with all the elements that would draw media who had already grown tired of the doom and gloom of AIDS, but were enchanted by the graphics and the chants and, and the, the, the movement and the street theater. And I remember specifically, this is um, early 1990, and uh, Woody Myers from Indiana was going to become the new health commissioner of New York City, and Woody Myers came from uh, Indiana where he had just said that he gave us quarantine. So we took to the streets several times to fight his appointment. And we were in Times Square one Saturday evening, and a reporter came up to me and said, okay, we're here again, we're covering your demo, but hey, what's going to happen one day when we don't cover your demos? And fighting the desire to take him by the lapels and beat the crap out of him, I said, well, I don't care if you don't cover our demos. How about covering the stories behind the demos? Cover the reason why 400 or 500 people have come out here on a cold Saturday night in January to raise hell in Times Square. But there were uh, moments of, of victory. It, it always required a lot of massaging, a lot of finessing, a lot of last minute media jockeying around. One of them was um, Stop the Church, which at the same time, uh, December of 89, was at the same time our most uh, notorious, but our also our most successful action, I would contend, because it really did put us out there in the mainstream um, in an amazing way. Um, in December of 1989, when an act up went to St. Patrick's Cathedral to, as you saw, to protest a number of uh, long-standing church policies concerning HIV and AIDS education, as well as women's reproductive rights. And um, there was an affin uh, several affinity groups that decided, unbeknownst to ACT UP as a whole, they went inside, and that was the nature of ACT UP. Affinity groups were self-empowered to do whatever they wanted to do, and they decided to go inside, and there were demonstrations and uh, flinging of condoms on the inside, and then specifically there was an act by one gentleman our beloved comrade Tom Keene, and he took the, uh, the host during communion, crumpled it, and said, withholding sacred sex is murder. That didn't get out there. His act got out there, and that's what threw everybody into a tizzy. Well, the, the interesting coda to all this is that during the next two weeks, we had to have another emergency press conference to explain <coughs> again why we were doing what we were doing, although I had theoretically been prepping the media for the last month, sending out press releases every week to explain the issues that were going to bring us to St. Patrick's. And a measure of the media's density and refusal to listen was that when the action finally happened, almost none of the issues were ultimately discussed in the media. It was a sensationalistic um, treatment of what happened on the inside and uh, demonization of us as blasphemers, etc. The, the funny coda to all this is that two weeks later, an article appeared in the New York Times praising us to high heaven for being, yes, rude and rash, but effective. So while everybody else was pillorying us, it was one of our greatest opponents, the New York Times, who ultimately in the city section, the front page of the city section, a piece by a gentleman named Jason DeParl, gave us that sweet vindication you know, so you just never know where it's going to come from. Uh, but um, that, so it was a mixed blessing. I'm sorry for all these religious illusions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was, um, yeah, that was a victory. Um, all right, I think you probably heard, uh, you, we've talked about a lot of issues. What do you think are currently the most pressing challenges or obstacles facing those intent on organizing street protests today? And in what ways are these challenges both different and similar to the challenges and obstacles faced by ACT UP? Um, so what lessons, I guess, both positive and negative can be drawn from ACT UP's experience? And you might want to mention this thing that you yeah. use, this little flyer. Um, you know, first, I mean, the Pope's going to be here tomorrow, so we've got a little daft plan, so I'm going to pass flyers out. I think well, that's the point of ACT UP. And it's nothing, not rocket science that actually equals life. And I think that's the lesson. 
over and over and over again. Before I thought, I thought, I didn't know you could do this. I mean, obviously, you have no talent, but you're angry and you feel a lot of feelings. And you have a lot of love for the people that are, you know that are getting sick, so you have to do something. And I thought, all of a sudden, you see a bunch of people in great t-shirts getting arrested together, and you want to be with them. And that, to me, was, changed my life. I just didn't know that that was doable. So I'll pass up the flyer. But, I mean, um, we're meeting at 9 a.m. at uh, Elizabeth, what's the church? 43rd and 3rd. I think, I think the lessons just continue to be action equals life. I mean, uh, there's so many ways we could build on what I just did, but I think that just keeping it really simple, um, ignorance equals death, action equals life. Those are the key pieces. I mean, the eighth, eighth pandemic didn't leave a bit of uh, injustice obscured. I mean, from gaps in housing to terrible inequalities in health care to racism and sexism, and homophobia, I mean, they all helped fuel this thing. They all helped fuel it. So we had to take activism around the world. I mean, from Brian Wilde's syringe exchange programs in East, East Harlem to Paul Farmer's AIDS clinics in Haiti to uh, Brazil's amazing capacity to break, you know, to fight and successfully beat big pharma and uh, create success in terms of their own means of production for AIDS drugs in Brazil to treatment action campaigns successful battle against big pharma and win win for health care in South Africa. I and mean, there have been so many wins. And I think that's the point that I also want to remember. There's so many wins. Um, but as the storyline sort of overlap from, you know, struggles for uh, struggles from Chavez to Brazil to to Prague, as those as those struggles overlapped, um, the same obstacles over we, we saw the same obstacles. We saw struggles against a system that rewards people over profits, profits over people. We saw um, a battle against war profiteering. We saw the link between terrorism and policing. I mean, these are similar obstacles that these movements face. Um, and yet, what ACT UP did, which is helped us talk about fighting, fighting drug companies, which they helped us talk about a way of actually getting, getting something done in terms of fighting drug companies. It helped us talk about a cultural politics in which you can't have justice without pleasure. I mean, it helps us talk about the pleasure of being with your friends and winning and getting something done. I mean, those are all really, really, really powerful things. I mean, if you see these videos, you can see people joyously taking up public space together. I stopped in that ask for permit. Right now, our the speaker of the city council just negotiated with the police department a way our right to public assembly. So we have to take that back. And I think the lesson just becomes, you don't ask for a right to... First Amendment, you take it. If you don't, as Bill Dobbs said, if you don't use it, you don't have it. So we have to use it. I mean, I'm, when I watch those videos, I just, I'm in awe of all the activists there. I'm embarrassed to be on the stage as opposed to all the other activists that did all the work, all the heroes out there. I'm just really grateful, and I think we have to build on that. Thank you. Thank you so much.